Okay, everyone, we're doing LLSA 2021 for emergency medicine. The article is a mouthful, malpractice in emergency medicine, a review of risk and mitigation practices for the emergency medicine provider by Ferguson et al. Salim, this is something that I don't like to think about very often, malpractice, and I gotta admit, I'm not the best provider in terms of always kind of putting that in the back of my brain when I'm doing my charting and et cetera but it's important, and so teach me. Yeah, I don't think any of us wanna get named in a lawsuit uh, or get sued or lose our license. Um, we spent so much time in school trying to learn and had to take so many tests and all the debt we have to pay off. Um, I think this is a super important topic, and uh, I'm really glad this made it into the LLSA articles. Um, really nice article, very well done. Um, they basically pulled 52 relevant studies um, from the literature. And then they kind of give us a bunch of like little data points, pearls and nuggets. And so that's what we're going to spend our time doing is like going through some of those different things. And I think some of the numbers are important, but also some of the prevention and mitigation strategies, I think is where the bang for the buck is here uh, with this paper. So emergency medicine is the 15th out of 25 medical specialties in terms of being involved in litigation. So we're about middle of the pack. And in one study looking at just over 11,000 claims arising from the ED, ED physicians were the primary defendants in only 19% of most cases. And the good news is the results were in favor of the physician in 70 to 80% basically closed out without indemnity payment. So basically we didn't have to pay out. Um, they were settled and that was it. So you just got named, got settled. Now, the good news is annually, 7.5% is the annual risk of uh, getting sued and 1.5% annual risk for actually having to pay out. So those numbers are, are pretty low. And I think the thing that this paper brings up is that we shouldn't practice defensively, but we should be aware of, of these numbers and kind of where we fall. Salim, quick question, and this may be a basic one, but what is an indemnity payment? So indemnity is basically that you just, you pay. So okay. you can get named in a litigation, so you get named in a lawsuit. Indemnity is that you pay. So kind of a redundant indemnity payment. It's the same thing. Indemnity means you're paying money. All right, sounds good. So just a fancy legal term for, hey, I've got to pay this patient because of some mistake that we did. Exactly. All right. Now, this is the bad news. If you get named in a suit, the average case from these 52 studies was 46 months. Um, that's a long time. And uh, the median uh, indemnity or payout was anywhere from 85,000 to 220,000. And then the authors bring out one important point, and that is that in kids that are less than one year old, 80% of the cases of payout are greater than a million dollars. So yeah. um, probably important to pay attention to those little ones um, in terms of when they come in. Maybe one of the reasons they make us so nervous. And just another example of kids sucking the financial lifeblood out of us. <laughs> speak from being a father. Now, in this paper, they break this into high-risk diagnoses that get missed and low-risk diagnoses that get missed. And a large bulk of malpractice claims are for high-risk diagnoses in the ED, and these include chest pain, missed myocardial infarction, abdominal pain, appendicitis, intracranial bleeding, pediatric fever, and meningitis, and then abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now, the one point to make out here is that chest pain, missed MI, is the largest monetary payment. Of all those things that I just listed, it is the largest one. And why you hear so many people talking about EKGs and learning how to read EKGs and looking for subtle signs of acute coronary syndrome. Um, but this is why, because it's the largest payout. And when you look at the frequency of diagnosis related claims um, in terms of uh, greatest monetary losses, it's going to be in the same order that these things happen. So, for example, chest pain is by far and away the most frequent, 21%. This is where you're going to see the greatest monetary loss. Next would be abdominal pain, missing an appendicitis. It's about 4%. And then the list goes on and on and down from there. But the one thing to remember from this slide, chest pain, missed MI, largest payout. 
As a matter of fact, it's so important that it's made its own pitfall slide, which is missed go. myocardial infarction is associated with the largest monetary payments in malpractice claims. So super important point. And the good news is this is not news to us. We know that. Uh, like you said, chest pain, that's why we're getting EKGs. That's why we don't want to miss them. Not just because we care about our patients' hearts, but also because, well, there's a lot of morbidity and mortality that can sometimes relate to well, mal malpractice. Absolutely. Now, when we look at low risk diagnoses, so those were the high risk ones. When we look at the low risk ones, the most frequent ones were either a missed fracture, uh, wounds with a missed foreign body or uh, tendon injuries. Um, these were by far and away the, the lowest kind of um, low risk diagnoses, but these are all important and they're ones that we've all probably missed. And again, it's the same thing. The frequency of the diagnosis related claim is similar to the areas of greatest monetary losses with fractures being the highest at 23% and wounds with missed foreign bodies being 2% and then down from there. Now, where I find these to be the biggest issue um, is when we're rushing through um, looking over the patient or if the patient comes in and is intoxicated. Um, so it's always important in these patients to go back and reassess them when they're more clinically sober and make sure they don't have any new complaints. I can't tell you the number of times I've gone back, somebody was drunk, I didn't see something on them. And then when they sobered up, they're like, by the way, my hand is killing me. And I x-rayed them and it turns out they actually have a fracture. So I think that's where these tend to happen. Now, the second thing they talk about in this review article is preventable errors. Um, that consistently are associated with litigation. And the first one they talk about is diagnostic fallacy. And this can occur in one of two ways. Either we don't order the right test because we're not thinking about something, or we interpret the test incorrectly. And this can happen in about 37% of cases. And this is why if I order imaging on my patients, I love my radiologists, and this is no knock on the radiologists. They don't have the patient in front of them, I do. I look at all my own images and I frequently will find a handful of diagnoses that got missed. And so just argues the point of if you're gonna order a test, make sure you follow up on it yourself. The second uh, thing they talk about is failure and documentation. And specifically what they talk about is a lack of documenting family medical history, the patient's medical history themselves, medical decision-making, and then reassessment. And you're gonna hear that reassessment part um, over and over again. The biggest one on this list is poor patient communication. By the way, the number one reason we get sued is because of poor communication with patients. Of all the things on the list, this is the most important. You know, Salim, these first three points, and I, I don't wanna sound trite here, but I remember these because I, I feel like in my clinical situation, I can knock out these three by just spending that initial five to 10 minutes with the patient and just really, you know, kind of, I think, okay, be your old school doctor, do your history, do your physical, and you take that extra time. I'm not going to order the inappropriate toast because I know what I'm looking for. I'm going to be a better documenter because I've done all the things I'm actually documenting. And the patient's like, yeah, that guy was in there for 10 minutes and talked to me and did the physical exam. And I know we get busy. I totally get that. But it's, I'm just saving that time and decreasing that risk by front loading my interaction with the patient. A hundred percent agree. Um, I, the two times I spend the most time with my patients is on the initial evaluation. And then when I go back and do my reassessment, um, by far and away, but sometimes just talking it out with the patient and then documenting that conversation is the best way to like prevent any of this from happening. Now, um, if you have a history of adverse relationships and malpractice suits, that's associated with being named in a subsequent litigation, um, failure to follow up on diagnostic testing. So like if you order a test and you just want to hurry up and get the patient out, but you don't have the result back, that's another thing that can happen that is resulted in this. And then these last two are no surprise to me. If you're sleep deprived, your decision making is probably not going to be so great. And that can lead to errors and that can potentially lead to more litigation. And then obviously when the department is busy, 
the nurses are overwhelmed with patients or they have one really sick one so they can't get to another one. These are all things associated with um, increasing your chances of litigation. Now here's the good news. Having formal EM training as opposed to being a non-emergency medicine residency trained physician reduces your risk of litigation. Turns out that if you're trained in emergency medicine, you have a lower likelihood of being sued. So the good news is, is that having formal EM training as opposed to being a non-EM residency trained physician reduces your risk of litigation. So the good news is for most of us, the chances of getting sued are going to be far, far lower uh, because we are trained uh, residency trained in emergency medicine. Now, additionally, training residents in medical legal risk reduction may also help reduce litigation and may afford some protection uh, through improved documentation. This is something that I feel like all residency programs are working on, um, but is, it's important uh, to teach our residents. Now, a couple of interesting points. So patients in the lowest quartile for patient satisfaction. So basically dissatisfied patients were two times as likely to file a complaint. And then providers who've had more than or equal to two complaints in the past were four times more likely to experience risk management episodes. And so this is, again, goes back to communication, right? Just being a good person, sitting down, talking to the patient, communicating, being transparent, doing some shared decision-making strategy. These would all avoid these things. Again, I've already said sleep disruption. It can distort your clinical decision-making and it can also degrade your interactions with patients. And then the last thing I'll say is that, and we all know this, we all get taught this in residency, but the later portion of the shift when you're more mentally fatigued, Night shifts in general are just all associated with diminished physician performance and mood, all of which can be associated with future uh, litigation. This is the best part of the whole paper. So that was a lot of numbers and a lot of things that are associated with. Good to know those, but now give me the tangible stuff. What is the stuff that I can do to prevent getting sued? And that's what I think they did a really good job with in this paper. Patient communication is more closely associated with legal risk than the nature or magnitude of the adverse outcome. In other words, if you're just a good doctor that sits down and talks to your patient, you're less likely to get sued than if you miss something. Patients don't wanna sue somebody they like. They wanna sue people they don't like. So communication, really, really big deal here. Now, they also go on to say like, mistakes are gonna happen, we're all human. And if one happens, express regret to the patient and the family, but don't admit fault. It's really important to not admit fault. Offer a plan of action and then frequently update the patient and the family. Document these discussions and make sure you're giving them periodic updates. It's going to make it less likely that you're going to get sued. Pearl on its own. If there was one thing I remember from this paper, it's this pearl right here. Good communication with the patient and the family is the best way to reduce your medical legal risk. Above anything else, misdiagnosis, how bad the diagnosis was that you missed, just being a good person and talking to the patient is by far and away the far biggest thing that will avoid litigation. Now, documentation. Um, this is all going to be dependent on the system that you work in, but if you happen to have an EMR that has the capability of pre-formatting charts or you have like a voice-to-text like dictation tool, this is gonna improve your documentation because of a couple of things. One, it ensures you get all the check boxes and you get all the components that need to go into the chart. It also ensures that your chart is just more complete. It can be annoying doing all the check boxes, but it just helps to make a better chart. It is what it is. Now, it also gives you more time to spend with your patients um, and it increases patient satisfaction because if you're able to do voice to text dictation, I'm personally much faster dictating than I am typing. And so therefore that just gives me more time around my patient. Now, again, this bears repeating, be very cognizant when you're documenting family history, medical decision-making and reassessment prior to discharge. All three of these are very important. Now document the use of clinical practice guidelines. This is also can be helpful. Uh, if there's a clinical practice guideline, like ASAP has a policy that supports such and such, document that the reason why you're doing is because of that clinical policy, because that can also save you from um, having to pay indemnity. Um, it doesn't necessarily save you from getting named in a lawsuit, but 
it definitely uh, helps you in terms of having to pay out or having any uh, untoward events happen um, in terms of litigation. Now, if you're going to go outside of a clinical practice guideline, you better have a good reason why. And you better document that reason why, because that can also be used against you if you happen to go outside of a clinical practice guideline. The last thing I'm going to say is that with high risk diagnoses, when the diagnosis is uncertain, document a broad diagnosis and make sure there's a clear follow up plan. For example, if you haven't CT somebody and they might have appendicitis, don't put gastroenteritis put abdominal pain because now you're respecting the fact that it could be gastroenteritis, but it could also be appendicitis. So don't put a specific diagnosis that downplays what the patient is coming in for. Be very broad in your diagnosis. Always, always, always remember to reassess and document the patient reassessment prior to discharge. I actually uh, do this in every patient, whether I'm admitting or I'm discharging. I kind of have a checklist of things that I like to go through. The first is I like to look at all the vital signs and make sure we have a new set of vital signs that are documented if the initial set was abnormal. The second is I like to go back and reassess my patient and see how they're doing in terms of the complaint they came in with. Is there pain, uh, their nausea, vomiting? Is it doing better? Is it not doing better? How do they feel? And then I also like to spend a little bit of time making sure there's no new complaints and to make sure that I've answered all the questions that the patient has. Now, one area to be really uh, careful with is in your intoxicated patients. You want to make sure you're assessing them for sobriety and especially reassessing them for sobriety at discharge uh, because this group has a high missed rate of fractures and intracranial hemorrhages. So really important to remember in those intoxicated patients. The last couple of things are, can the patient perform their activities of daily living? I know we're quick to disposition patients, but if they can't perform their activities of daily living, they're probably not appropriate for discharge and you're more likely to get named in a suit. And then make sure finally that you've answered all triage complaints. Sometimes the patient will come in and have multiple complaints and only one of those complaints gets answered. Make sure you've at least acknowledged the other complaints. They may not necessarily need to be worked up in the ER, but that you've at least acknowledged them and documented about them in the chart. So kind of a long list, Matt, but I think important. Each of them has very important components to it. Yeah, it goes back to your point of front loading your conversation and like you said, back loading your conversation with that patient and just kind of bookending the whole experience with good communication. Now for the written discharge instructions, make sure you use simple language. I think most of us have discharge instructions that are built into our EMRs or some discharge software that we can use. And most of those are pretty well done, but if not, and you're just free texting it, just make sure it's in simple language uh, so that the patient can understand and it's to their either language of choice um, or to their literacy level. Now, AMA. This is one that I was always confused about as a resident, and they do a really nice job in this review article talking about this. So it's not just having a patient sign an AMA form. It's not that simple. So first of all, it has to be written at at least an 11th grade reading level, which is what's legally, I guess, recommended based on this article. The discussion can be complex, and it's going to require situational understanding, not just from the physician, but also the patient. Now, this is the thing that's really important is that AMA discharge only gives you partial protection in malpractice cases. It doesn't give you full protection. It only gives you partial protection. So if you're going to do this, it's not as simple as like, oh, I'm tired of dealing with this patient. Just send them away. You need to ensure a few things. So first of all, you need to make sure that the patient is fully informed of the risks and potential alternatives. They have capacity to make that decision. And that there's no reason for involuntary admission criteria. All three of those need to be met if you're thinking about going down this AMA pathway. And then as far as documentation in your chart, first of all, make sure you document it. Make sure you document the reason for why the patient wants to leave and oftentimes do it in their own words. Make sure that you still give them a reasonable follow-up plan, an open invitation to return to the ED, and then sometimes it may be having to give them prescriptions. Like for example, if uh, uh, I want to discharge somebody or I want to admit somebody who's septic for diverticulitis and they're refusing and I think they have capacity, 
Well, it doesn't mean that I'm just going to discharge them and let them go. I'm going to give them an alternative. Maybe I'll give them PO antibiotics, but again, with very specific instructions on why to come back. And that just goes to the point, Salim, that this does not have to be confrontational. Actually, it shouldn't be confrontational. It's the patient will sometimes make decisions that we don't agree with. And so while it sounds like you're leaving against my advice, it's like, no, nah, okay, I get it. You're going to go because you've got whatever going on. But it doesn't stop me from doing all the other stuff that you said, treating you with what another option, option B. Uh, tell them, look, if you get worse, come on back. We're not mad at you for leaving against medical advice. We're here. We care about you. And so don't feel bad about, you know, coming back here if you're not getting better or you just want to come back because it's getting worse. Yeah. I mean, I had a recent case of a, a patient that had uh, acute uncomplicated uh, appendicitis, but they met sepsis criteria and they were pretty tender. And I wanted to admit them for OBS for IV antibiotics and they refused. And I was getting kind of frustrated. And I just took a few minutes to ask them why they wanted to go home so badly. And it turned out that the job they were working required that they work for another two days to be able to get their money to put food on the table and pay their rent. And that was the reason why they weren't willing to stay. It wasn't that they weren't listening to what I was saying. There was just another reason. And so I ended up giving them PO antibiotics um, and let them go home. Uh, but I documented that conversation and the reason for them going home. Um, and I gave them very specific instructions. I did actually get the patient's cell phone number and call them and follow up with them. They actually ended up doing great with just the PO antibiotics. So very fortunate. but. Patients have different situations that we don't sometimes consider, and it's not always our medical judgment of why they're saying no. So just to the point. Yep. Now, as far as follow-up, um, I think, again, this is something we all understand. Scheduled follow-up for all ED patients, it reduces diagnostic error. That's why it's so important. Um, obviously, I worry less about patients I admit, and I say worry less in terms of not diagnosing something because there's usually waves of specialists or other doctors that are now putting eyes and hands on the patient. And so they're more likely to find something that I missed. It's the ones that go home that don't have follow-up that I worry about are the ones that keep me up at night, the one that I was worried about. And so making sure that they follow up or that they have the ability to follow up is going to be key here. Um, in this review article, they talk about text reminders uh, for follow-up uh, can help with appointment compliance. Again, I think that's going to be system dependent. That's not something I have in my system, but certainly an interesting thought. And then uh, a good way to follow up all pending diagnostic tests. For example, if you have blood cultures that are going to take 48 hours and the patient's going home, have a system in place that you can call the patient and follow up uh, on the results of those studies. That's what I got for you, Matt. I thought this was a really good paper. Well done. Lots of uh, good strategies, very tangible things that we can do. Yes, yeah, Liam, a lot of information in this paper. And, you know, I want to boil it down to your pearl, right? The life pearl, communication and be a good person. And hopefully you can't prevent everything, but you can at least decrease your chance of uh, malpractice. This is Hippo Education.